And welcome back to the RinkWise podcast. I am your host, Evan Marinofsky, and today I am joined by the new, our big free agent acquisition, Patrick Donnelly. Pat, what's up? What's going on? Making my podcast debut. You are. This is no exciting. No rookie lap today. Yeah. You, 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 uh, we don't believe in rookie laps. We, yeah. uh, we, we're like the Bruins. We're equal play, playing field. You know, it doesn't matter your experience level. Uh, but very excited to have you on. How have your first, what is it? Has it been three weeks now? Um, honestly, it might be like a month on the dot. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been busy. Um, well, like, you know, busy getting into the swing of things. Yeah. Like calling coaches, you know, early on there, you know, five calls a day. <laughs> like, all right. Um, but yeah, we're in the swing of things. Season's here. Excited to get going. Yeah, no, it's, I'm excited to see you get going. Um, cause you had a great story, uh, like your second week on why Massachusetts, yeah. uh, ha- has been so effective at developing, girls hockey players and it's very interesting because a lot of those girls are in prep school yep. um and it was a fascinating story just how uh mass does it right with the girls side now obviously on the boys side that's something i think we're probably going to get into in later episodes mm-hmm. you know it, it, in the spring when things uh, open up a bit but what did you notice uh, i know this is girls prep but it kind of does tie into girls prep what did you notice kind of in the uh, in how mass develops uh, girls hockey and what you learned yeah so i mean a lot of it has to do with um you know kevin cavanaugh and ed bourget were both awesome to talk to yeah that story great people um and you know both of them kind of just echoing along the similar lines where it's you know there aren't many like maybe minnesota oh obviously minnesota Mm -hmm. is up there but other than that there's not many places around the country that have you know the amount of club teams local youth teams um training programs the level of coaching like just massachusetts especially considering you know proximity for the entire state it's really just one of the best i guess breeding grounds for for that sort of thing and you know, Ed was saying how really, unless like, obviously you got to account for if you're coming from like the Cape and the islands. But other than that, like you can probably get to anywhere in the state within like two hours. Oh and yeah. Especially if you choose a central location like Worcester, Marlboro, um, you know, you can probably, most teams and players can probably get there within an hour um, from yeah. any point in the state. Um, and so you're really able to, you know, get best on best competition. Players are able to, um, there, there, there's just plenty of options. There, there are. And I think that's one of the things that like I really took from it in that, you know, I think on the girls side, you know, there isn't as much competition around the mm-hmm. country for to 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 get those to get that talent. Right. We yeah. see on the boys prep side, you know, a lot of the higher end boys prep players leave at 15, 16, yep. 17 to go to these junior programs around the country. Um, and I just think that on the girls side, the, the way that Mass is doing it in New England as a whole seems to be doing the right things and i think you you sort of see that uh in the prep world because i think it's um it's been you know very 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 prevalent uh so today we're going to get into the top 10 girls prep teams um and so just kind of to start um how was it coming up with this top 10 list what was the what was the fun what was the not so fun what was it Um, like so so not so fun is like full disclosure i'm pretty new into the prep prep (laughs) world um and, uh, you know, I can tell you who the usual powerhouses are and stuff. But, you know, when you get into the nitty gritty like this and you're like you're hemming and hawing over, oh, is four too high? They should be that should they be six or is seven too low. Should they be five? You know, you, like it's like, you know, they're going to be in the top 10 and really outside of maybe one and two. I feel like any of these teams could have gone anywhere in the top 10. Um, so that was, you know, that was the not so fun part. Just like, ugh, you know. Who, who's this guy talking it, about our team? No, that's exactly. <laughs> um, but that you know what? It's it is what it is. And yeah. uh, you're a smart person, and I have full confidence. In it. But the big thing is like with any top ten list, and you know this, like it just changes so quickly. Yeah. Like this this will this list the boys prep list boys on my girls on my any list. I mean, we could power rank NHL teams right now, and it would change within a week. Yep. And I think once this season starts uh, on both the boys and girls prep side, um, there's going to be a lot of change. And I think that's what makes it fun. Is like these teams. Teams are constantly trading places. You know, you, you know, a Nobles isn't going to fall out of the top 10, but they, you know, where we have them on the list now, they could slide down three, they could go up two, they go up, you know, four. Um, 
So I think, you know, in terms of lists, uh, it's always fun. And and you know what the best part is when you see people at ranks and they're like, oh, you're not going to rank us in the top 10, huh? We, we're not good enough to, to crack your 10, you know? And it's, I, I always love that because, you know, it's, uh, it, it means people care, which is the, yeah, yeah. which is the most fun thing. Um, but, you know, you hit it uh, in that, in that last part to, you know, I think to everyone, it feels like number one is pretty clear in this. Yeah. And I feel like. You see that in any poll, you gotta you gotta tip the cap to the the defending champ. I mean, in Williston, it, they're they're gonna be great once again mm-hmm. either way. Um, but you know, last year twenty seven zero and one, their only blemish was a, a tie. Um, and you know, they they lose Emily Crovo, who's a freshman at Holy Cross now playing, um, but they still have their pretty much their top line back. Monique Lyons, uh, Nora Curtis, Violet Carroll. They combined, I think. Uh, Krista Talbot Saifu said for 132 points last year. Ah, that's so, not bad. Yeah, it's, it's you know decent. <laughs> that's all right. Um, and and Lions set a program record with 50 points. Um, so yeah, pretty pretty decent. You have some really all world players coming back, and then on defense you have uh, Caroline Offiero. She's committed to Clarkson. Um, you know they lost experience, especially in Crovo, but they bring back so many heavy hitters of la- of the last two teams that won NEPSAC titles that it's hard to not put them on. Yeah, to me, they feel like a favorite. It's so hard to win three in a row. It's hard to win two in yeah. a row. It's hard to win one, yep. but it's really hard to win two, and it, obviously it's even more hard to win three because the teams under Williston, and we're going to get into it more, are stronger than last year, I think, yep. and are more apt to uh, uh, you know challenge Williston. And Phillips Andover was great last year at, at, at challenging them, but um, Williston, I mean, you mentioned, brings back those players uh, I think in a situation like that, where that that culture of winning is there, um, it's really hard to take them down. And I think they're going to be. I mean, they're the easy favorite to yeah. me. And and you know a lot of what we talk about with prep, boys boy side, girl side, it's you know experience matters so much. Mm-hmm. And, and even though you know some of the returners might not be the headliners that some of the other schools have, they have that experience of winning back to back titles, of knowing what it takes. And obviously, Chris is a great coach, so she's going to have him ready to play. That's the big thing, I think, is the ex- and, and you you nailed it. It's experience. So you do know what you're talking about when it comes to prep, which yeah. is good. But you're right. I mean, it, the experience, the, like talent is one thing, especially like younger talent. Like we mm-hmm. all, we always fix it in the air talent. Oh, who's coming up? You know, who are the 08s? Who, yeah. who, who are the who's 09s? Committed? Yeah, exactly. But it's also like to to win to go deep like you know um even on the boys side last year avon old farms their top players were all seniors they'd all been there for three four years yep. so um you know williston re, uh going for the three-peat becoming a dynasty there are 2000 patriots or the 2000 <laughs> patriots i uh, would not surprise me or surprise anybody um but as i said there are lots of teams below them who look poised to Take them down potentially. Uh, number two, who do you got? Yeah, number two, we got Phillips Andover, runners up last year. They were 24 3 and 1. Um, some significant departures. You know, we just talked about experience. They lost eight seniors. Yeah, that's which, a lot. That is a um, lot. That is a lot. But when you look at who they have coming back, whether it's, um, we talked about the USA team a couple minutes ago Molly Boyle um, on defense, Caroline Av- Averill. Um, and Maggie Averill, who's going to be a freshman this year. Mm-hmm. And Maggie is one of the best defense prospects in the country for her birth year. Um, Caroline has it could be, you know, maybe one of the best players in the NEPSAC this year. Molly Boyle is obviously committed to Yale. She's been doing her thing for quite a while at Phillips. And they've just been knocking on the door for a couple of years now. Um, feels like that this year could, especially, you know, they lost that, that leadership, but with just those core headliners in place, they could just be in line for another step. That's the thing, and and you know, it's interesting uh, what they've done. Uh, I remember last year sitting here with Stephanie Wood, and we were kind of going through the the top 10, and um, Phillips Andover was at eight, and Stephanie was like, that's, that's the team that is, that's a sleeper team. They are going to compete, they are going to move up, and they did, they got all the way to the Elite Eight final. Um, and that's kind of another example. And the Averill family, I mean, my God, they are pumping yeah. out some really strong hockey talent. Yeah, Ann's playing D1 at Dartmouth. This yeah. Year as a freshman. Um, just no end there. Yeah. They're the, they're the Hugheses of the, <laughs> of the, of the mass um, hockey. Yeah. Um, 
And it's fascinating to see because, and I think that's really one of the cool things when you see these families and you see it on both sides, you know, you, especially at the prep level, you see, you know, uh, you know, even like I know on the boys side, like the Isermans, mm -hmm. I mean, they all, and they're more spread out, but, um, yeah, I mean the Averills, uh, have had so much success. Molly Boyle's a stud. Yep. Um, so, uh, to me, I agree with you. I think Phillips is probably most definitely poised to, and I think also like, if they get back to the championship, right? Let's let's play this game. If they get back to the championship in the Elite Eight and they're facing Williston, it's very hard to go to the championship two years in a row and lose. It's yes. almost harder to lose two years in a row than it is to win two years in a row. Yeah. So I'm curious if they can get back, what they can do to Williston. Yeah, I mean, we talk about experience and, you know, when when we've talked about pro hockey in the past and, yes. and we talk about, we put there's so much emphasis on, oh, you got to figure out how to lose before you figure out how to win. Exactly. Um, so maybe for that core that, you know, last year, that experience last year is just what they needed to, you know, sort of set them over the top this year. That might be it. That might be it for Phillips. Uh, number three, who do you have? So I have Tabor, 19-4-2 uh, and two last year. Um, Eric Long has, you know, Top goal scorer Lizzie Greeley coming back. Um, your top defender Caitlin Sullivan, Addy Peskowski. Um, so again, sort of like Andover, they were pretty experienced, an older team last year, but they still have pretty much their core players coming back. Um, and, you know, Juliana Gafredo, um, Eric talked about, is someone who was really good last year when she was healthy. Injuries kind of knocked her out up, off and on last season. She thinks, you know. Um, Fully healthy for season for her, as well as Whitney Daco. And then, you know, they have a couple newcomers um, out of Groton, Elizabeth Jacobson, and out of NMH, they have Avery Olson. So adding some experience there, and they'll both have some opportunities to step up in the crease. Getting used to the transfer portal. Yeah. Uh, which is which is great. Um, it's interesting, you know, Tabor went down in the first round of the Elite Eight last year to Nobles. And I always find it interesting. Uh, I remember on the boys' side talking to Cushing last year, and Cushing had a really humiliating loss. This it, They lost 2-1 to one to Nobles. It's not really humiliating, but uh, I remember Cushing lost to Avon uh, Five, or it wasn't a it was uh i think it was avon one of those teams two years ago lost like five nothing in the first round and uh you know it was really humiliating loss really really bad and they were just so hungry to get back and to, to avenge that and i'm curious if like Tabor lost you know nobles was a five seed last year they were a four it's not really an upset per yeah, se yeah. um just because it's you know it's it, you know it's a four and a five seed. It's hard to you know it's not exactly March Madness with the four and five seeds, but um, I do think that they they seem to be. And you mentioned you know the returning players coming back, the newcomers coming in. That's a team that I think is poised to potentially go deep, and I think is a strong candidate um, for number three. I think the team that is best or most likely to get into the top three that isn't there now is the team you have at number four. Yeah, Nobles twenty three six zero last year. Um, you know, you don't want to say last year was disappointment, but you know, just for all the by their standards, yeah, all the success that Tom Reesers had there, and they lost in the semifinals, albeit I believe it was to Williston. So you know, you lose to the team that wins. It was one nothing. It was close. You know, tip your cap. Um, but you know, they still they lost Brooke Manning last year. She's at Harvard now, but they have again some key pl key players coming back. You know, Molly McCartan, Callie Brown. Um, they'll be kind of in the mix up front. And then on defense is the big one, Olivia Mafio, mm. or Maffeo, who's going to Boston College. And she played forward the last two seasons, led the team in scoring with 35 points. But, you know, she plays defense for club team. She is committed to BC for defense. Um, and so she's going to be sliding back there. And so, you know, Tom's kind of hoping that it'll not only help the transition game, but also just, you know, spark the offense from the back end a little bit. Um, and it shouldn't be an issue for her because she's been able to produce – from the back end for club all year. Um, and then a net, they still have, um, oops, sorry. Anya um, Zubkowska, right? Yes. Yes. Um, she's up committed to Brown. Mm -hmm. Um, so obviously when you have a D one commit and goal, that obviously, you know, that settles, helps. settles things <laughs> down for you. And that you makes all, things easier. And even with, with Ma Maffeo on defense, you have Jamie Griswold, who's also committed to BC. Yep. So, you know, Nobles is again, um, kind of like, you know, Tabor Phillips and, and Wilson, you know, they have those headliners in place. It's just a matter of if they can take that next step to replace, um, you know, a player like Brooke Manning. And 
I think with Maffeo, like it's interesting because she was up at forward the last two years now on the on the back end, and I, you know I think that could be a potential X factor for them in terms of yeah. create offensive creation, but also you know again instead of her maybe scoring all of those, she's gonna be setting up a lot of yep. teammates, yep. and I think players up front, those girls are going to have higher point totals because you have a really good passer getting the yeah. puck to you and everything. Yeah, someone who can um, not only lead the rush, but you know, quarterback the quarterback the blue line, take care of the power play, um, you know, shouldn't be an issue for her. And, and she's been, like, like I said, just producing no matter where she's been. It shouldn't be an issue for her. No, it shouldn't. Um, and the other thing that you can't discount is Tom Reeser is a coaching legend. Okay. Yes. That's a guy who has yes. it has gained the respect of everybody, had enormous success. I mean, Nobles uh, is a powerhouse in large part due to him. And you can't underestimate how much those girls want to play for him. Yep. And especially in his final year, you did a story on this for the magazine. Yep. They they really want to win Send this. Send them out with one more. Oh, yeah. So what did, and what did you take away? So the magazine... Isn't out yet. It is almost out. So by the time people are listening, this we're recording uh, November twentieth on a Monday. Um, so we are not. It's pre Thanksgiving, by the way. We, yeah. should, we should get into some Thanksgiving <laughs> food talk. That's what we should do. Um, but this is more important uh, for Nobles. I mean, what did you 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 did a story on uh, research final season? What did you take away from that, or sort of your your highlights from it? Yeah. So I talked to um, not only Tom but Brooke Manning and Emmy O'Leary, um, and you know just. Um, and O'Leary's at Princeton right now. She was captain two years ago. Um, what just the overarching takeaway from them specifically was that, yeah, he has all this success on the ice and, you know, he's created a powerhouse, but, you know, the real difference maker playing for him has been, you know, just how much he cares for his players off mm -hmm. the ice. And, you know, one of the, not, not to spoil the magazine here, but there's a great story both of them had. And it was, you know, just asking them what, what comes to mind first. And it was, they both had the same story right away. Wow. Um, and it was two years ago, maybe three years ago, they were playing in the Elite Eight title game um, out in Worcester, and he couldn't be there. He had a wedding to be at. Like, they, like, told him the day before because they found out what, like, they were playing and stuff. He's like, I'm not going to be able to make it. And so they're in the title game. There, it was back and forth game. I think they're up 5-4 in closing seconds, and doors to the rink fly open, and it's it's Tom Reeser um, who – assuredly broke traffic laws to get off because <laughs> um i don't know where the wedding was but he had to take a flight and you know landed it must have been logan made his way to worcester to be there for like the final horn of the game oh my god and like the whole bench and place is going nuts so that was um you know just kind of shows who he is as a person and um uh brooke manning also said that you know he had taken sabbaticals last two springs but still came back for graduation mm -hmm. um so it's really just you know the uh, the the on ice success is what it is, but you know, really, what he's done off the ice at Nobles. I've had this conversation with Stephanie Wood a bunch. I feel like you know you can drop X's and O's best you can, yeah. But to get players to play for you and care about you, yep. and you have to care about them. And yeah. I think that's I think he embodies that a lot um, throughout his time at Nobles. But yeah, it's a good story. I don't want to act like I haven't read it. I freaking <laughs> <laughs> I did read it. Um, Number five. So we're rounding out the top five. Now it feels like we're getting into very much people could go anywhere five through ten. Who do you have five? Yeah, so five, I have St. Paul's. This was, again, one of those, oh, they could be four to six, seven. <laughs> is, so could be anywhere. Yeah. Um, and so they have, um, you know, they made it to the large school championship last year, won it. Um, and it was, I think it was 19, eight and two overall last year and. Really, the second half was when they just came on. It was they went on a fifteen three and two run, um, and so now they obviously the, the natural next step is to get back into that elite eight mix. Um, so Kelly Mackey has uh, Ali Martinello coming back in net. Um, she was huge for them down the stretch. Took home turn of an MVP, shutouts in the semis and the championship, and then uh, Cami Bell um, mm -hmm. the back up front to lead the skaters. Um, she's won back to back Loomis medals at St. Paul's, which is their top female athlete. Um, wow. Yeah. So pretty impressive, um, you know, Kelly, quote, called her one-of-a-kind athlete. Um, so special player there. And then, you know, they add in some experience. Um, you know, they get out of Williston, they get Ava Hunter. Um, so, again, it's sort of that natural progression. You know, win the large school title, you have that experience of winning. Now get into that Elite Eight stratosphere. That's interesting that Ava Hunter uh, transferred from Williston, um, you know, considering. And I think it's also a big... Uh, Addition, because you know this St. Paul's team has won a large school championship. Yep. You, you're bringing someone on the roster who's won an elite eight. 
Um, so I'm very curious to see uh, how that goes down. But yeah, Ali Martinello and Nat, I think is, you know, you mentioned the difference maker. I think yeah. having, you know, you look at a lot of these scores in the Elite Eight, in the Elite Eight tournament, and even the large school and the small school, these are not high scoring games. These are very uh, defense heavy, goal tending games. I think to have someone like uh, Ali and Nat, I think probably uh, bo- uh, boosts their chance at uh, getting an Elite Eight uh, bid come, yeah, the, come March. It just settles everything else down. Like, oh, yeah. You know, you don't have to worry about your goaltender. Everything else just falls in I mean, look at the Bruins, you know, I mean, (laughs) (laughs) makes makes things easier. Hey, it's Bobby Moran, Director of Athletics at Thayer Academy. You know what? Experience matters. And Thayer Academy's professional coaching staff understands how to work with each student athlete to help them succeed. Our coaches and faculty are committed to ensuring both 5th to 12th graders feel known, connected, and prepared. This is Thayer's secret sauce. Nurturing each student to reach their full potential. Here, success is truly a team sport. Are you ready for your child to take the next step? See what Thayer has to offer at Thayer.org. That's T-H-A-Y-E-R dot O-R-G. Um, number six, uh, you have Kent. Yeah, we have Kent. So 19-4-0, they made the Elite Eight semis last year. Um, new coach this year, Sam Fatorix mm-hmm. from Kimball Union. Um, and so they, they're kind of in a similar boat as, as St. Paul's where, um, you know, the, just the core that they're bringing back, you know, Lauren Ferrari's back. She was the security blanket last year. Hell of a last name. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they, you know, they have the headliners up front. Me and Montanari is committed to RPI. Megan Duplantis committed to Dartmouth. You have on the blue line, Sophie Russo's back, Elizabeth Bonner, Caitlin Pierce, um, who plays both forward and D. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... You know, when you look at whether it's a fresh voice for Sam Fatorik, who says calls himself, you know, players coach, loves to win, hates to lose more than anything else. Um, I've never heard that from a coach before. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's crazy, brand new. Right? Um, but yeah, you know, you have that, like we said, fresh voice. You have the goalie back, which is the huge thing. Um, you know, you have your headliners up front, Division One talent. Um, it just feels like they could be. Again, lead eight semifinals last year could be in line for maybe a deeper run. Yeah, I think Fatorik adding him is, is really good. I think yep. it's smart. I mean, he comes from Kimball Union, which is a great background, a great program, both mm-hmm. on the boys' and girls' side. So I think that matched with just kind of the players they have up front. That's why to me, like when I look at this, and we're going to get into 7, 8, 9, and 10 and, and everything, but when you look at this uh, th- this landscape, you know, Williston is the favorite. It's You know, they're the elite eight favorite 100%, but... I mean, any of these teams, you know, good goalie with St. Paul's yep. and Nobles has the Reeser effect his last season. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, I remember on the boys side last year, Paul Canada announced his retirement uh, in January. This is, he was dying to leave. And granted, it wasn't preseason, but I mean, those guys played for him so hard. They were the number three seed in the Elite Eight. And yeah. we and they were not in our top 10 <laughs> before the season started. <laughs> so I think, you know, I, I think there's a lot of talent. There's a lot of teams that I think could be in the mix. And that leads us perfectly into number seven, which you have Loomis Chafee. Yeah, Loomis is one of those teams where I felt like they might have could they could have been higher. Just, you know, we talk so much about experience. Um, so Liz Lydon's team. Um, 14, seven and four last year made the lead eight quarters. Um, they have five seniors, five juniors, and they had, I think she said it was, you know, seven freshmen last year who all played pretty significant roles. And obviously, mm-hmm. you know, they have that first year experience under them, under their belts. They are expected to take a step this year as sophomores. And, you know, they have four of their top six coming back for forwards, uh, top two scorers, Chloe Obzer and Grace Moran are back, um, on defense. They have Megan Hosman and Carly Dan. Um, and then, you know, whether it's the captain, Emma Hanna, or you have both goalies coming back, Layla Fournier and Adeline Roper. Both of them played last year. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, again, another one of those, um, you know, key pieces. And, every you know, you, have, you don't have to worry about your goalies. You have your defense headliners. You have your top two scores. It's just, you know, settles everything in around the roster. Did you get a sense from uh, from Loomis on who will be the starter for them in that? Or are they going to platoon? Like, did, did they kind of give it? Or did they just say, oh, it's both. It's, they're yeah, going to see she, who takes she kinda, it. Um, you know, it'll be both probably to start. You know, yeah. Both played last year. So, um, but yeah, it just, you know, with that experience, especially five seniors and five juniors, and especially you have um, Hosman and Katie Collins, who both played at the U18 select camp mm-hmm. over the summer. Um, just that, you know, again, national development program talent, um, you know, really should settle things in nicely. The other thing with them is like you mentioned the seven freshmen. Um, 
obviously they're all expected to take step forward steps forward but even if like three or four do to have three or four sophomores who are legitimate producers and legitimate uh they they always you know kind of give something to the team that goes a long way and that also helps with that future core yep. of loomis when you're ranking them next year or the year after i think they're going to start to move up these rankings even more um than number seven uh yeah, and some some of those sophomores too that I, that i mentioned like you know some of them were also at you know the us 15 camp or yeah. the 16 17 camp you have Lindsay stebnowski annie schwartz and and bella zalezi and you know Liz Lydon's really, really excited to see the step that, you know, Annie Schwartz can take this season. And it's cool for her to develop that talent yes. and to kind of get them in her hands and uh, get them in the next steps of their career. Uh, number eight, a team that is no stranger to our top 10 mm -hmm. and no stranger to being a force at the girls and boys uh, prep hockey side, uh, Dexter Southfield. Yeah, Dexter, another one of those teams that made the Elite Eight last year, 17-5-3 and three on the year. They fell to Kent in OT. Um, and so, you know, they, they lose Amelia Lynch and Ainsley Moulton. They're both playing D1 this season. Yeah, Ainsley um, Moulton was great last yeah, year, I remember. Yeah, I mean, we talked about just the last few teams having the goalie figured out. And you yeah. lose your, you your Division One caliber goaltender. Uh, but, you know, Maggie Javerna has still got the, the talent coming back. You know, some of their top scorers, like Brenna Hines is back. Um, impact defender, you have, you have Elena Dunn back in the fold. Maddie Murphy, who just committed to Boston College, is in that sort of USA stratosphere, too. Um, it's again one of those you know you have those key pieces in place and I think it's Dexter has that culture of we're gonna be good yeah we're always gonna find a way to be good yep. and I think that's I think that's why to me I think you have them in the perfect spot you know lose the goalie but you still have pieces there you're still Dexter um, I, to me, you have it in the right spot with, at, at eight, or at least in the bottom three. Uh, Groton is an interesting one. You have them at nine because they have yeah. a prospect that I think could be one of the – it was already a breakout star last year, but I think really could take a next step this year. Yeah, you know, you always have those teams that you know you you fall in love with as a bit of a sleeper. You yeah. Don't, you don't want to put them too high, but you don't want to put them too low. Um, but, yeah, Groton, I think this might be it for you. Yeah, this, I th this is probably it. Groton was 18-4-4 four four last year. They went to the small school title game, mm -hmm. um, but just the, the pieces – they have coming back specifically tina scalise who, yeah you know tim Leroy, tim Leroy calls her um a program changer she as a freshman last year 43 points 23 goals um that's you know crazy pretty good <laughs> um you know maddie cronin's back she had 34 points last year um defense they have kira Lai, who's committed to harvard um veronica hadamoski and net was one of the the best in new england last year with a 954 and she's still looking for that d1 offer somewhere um, so, you know, she's motivated to have another good season. But really, you know, Tina Scalise as a sophomore is who, who we're going to be focusing on. And I think a lot of colleges are going to be focusing on Tina Scalise yeah. this year, yep. too, because she's a sophomore now. And once that I think it's the same on the girls side, once that January 1st deadline hits, they can start to reach out. I think yeah, I'm correct I on that. So. Yeah, I, I, I know that she's her games are already being watched by colleges. I, Tim said. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, just just with the potential there, you know, as a team that kind of scratched the surface last year in a small school title game, but you have all these returning pieces coming back, especially, you know, Crone and Lai, and then the goalie, again, we talked about how important the goalies are, um, and it just, you know, Scalise, just what sort of season she, what, what sort of leap she can take. And I'm year. sorry, but a 954 save percentage, uh, she should absolutely be getting college looks, which yeah. I, I'm guessing she is. I'm yes. guessing she yes. is. Um, and I just think, you're, so you want, Groton's your sleeper, right? Yeah. That, that's Gr it? Groton's that, like, you know, the, the preseason darling. That, I like that. that you know, the, not the, not to keep using NHL examples, but after you know they had that run in the bubble, everyone was like, "Oh my God, the Canucks are here." Um, <laughs> Hopefully, they're a little bit better than yeah, the Canucks. Yes, yes, yes. Hopefully, they're I, gonna bring I in Rick Tockett. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Very excited to see what sort of step Grant can take this year. Yeah, that's an interesting one because you you nailed it. They have they have the exciting talent up front. They've got uh, you know solid defense, but again, the goaltending um, I think is going to be key for them. So yeah, Groton, I would not be surprised if we're, because we're going to be doing these podcasts a lot throughout the season. Mm -hmm. So this one little thing we're tweaking this year is you and I are going to come in here, I think it might be every week, okay. and discuss kind of boys prep, girls prep. You know, We'll do some MIAA as well, just kind of what the big storylines of the yep. week are. Um, I would not be shocked if we're sitting here in like mid January. It's like freezing cold out where, you know, we're like, you know, all layered up and we're like, yeah, Groton has moved into like number four. So yeah. it would, wouldn't shock anybody. Um, and then number 10, you have uh, Milton. Yeah. Milton 14, eight and two last year. And they're, they're sort of like, kind of like Groton. They're just on the up and up here mm -hmm. um, where they made the elite eight for the first time in program history last year. 
Um, they have the Harrington Holiday Tournament every year, and that's always on, yep. that's always a hard schedule. They were runners up last year, their best finish. Um, so Ryan Stone really just has them going in the right direction. Um, and but we talk about the experience. They they lost eight seniors. That's, that's that hurts. Yeah, that's not insignificant. But sneaky, um, you know. And Ryan talked about you know she's really under the radar. They have their top scorer Rebecca White back. She's mm-hmm. their number one center. Um, and then for impact forwards like Christina Sweeney, Julia Gooden. Um, Susanna Ward on defense, and then they get a junior transfer out of NMH, Ashley Clarkson, and then both goalies are back, Lori DeGuyer and Ava Scannell. Lori kind of took the reins towards the end last year. I think Ryan said Ava battled some injuries, but had they gone further in the Elite Eight, it probably would have been Lori's net. Um, but, you know, both goalies saw time last year. Both goalies played well, so they know what they're getting there. They're going to start in a platoon. And, you know, really, it's, again, they lose eight seniors, but they have – Again, the headliners back. Becca White is a huge one. And I, and I, you. So your story on Milton uh, for the website ran Monday morning, and it's, it's they and and uh, you know they talked about Ryan Stone talked about this. They're not a flashy team, you know. Yeah. They don't have the 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 can't miss prospect, but they have a lot of good solid pieces that get you into elite eight contention. Yeah, and they have that you know sort of mentality that. Um, they, I guess, need to play with, I guess, and he has them playing with the right way where, you know, we're just going to outwork everybody. Mm-hmm. It worked last year. Um, and even then, like, you know, he talked about how, again, as, and with the ISL, the Harrington tournament, how just difficult the schedule is where, you know, the first nine or ten games are huge. But even then, if it doesn't go ideally out of, as perfectly out of the gate, you know, your schedule is so tough, you still have a little wiggle room and some grace where, as long as you figure things out, you should still be in a good position to make the turn. Do you want to skate fast? For 50 years, Laura Stam instructors have taught youth players to pros how to skate correctly, powerfully, and fast. Players who attend Laura Stam power skating programs learn how to skate fast by learning how to execute every maneuver in hockey. They become powerful, stable, efficient, and explosively fast skaters. If you can't wait for a clinic, join our subscription skills video service and we'll show you the skills taught at our clinics in an easy-to-use video format with training plans to guide your training. Register or subscribe now at laurastam.com. That's L-A-U-R-A-S-T-A-M-M dot com. You can learn to skate fast. Were there any teams uh, that you wanted to include in this that were ju- that just missed? I know you just started, so I don't want to yeah. put you in a position where you're like, oh, I had you know five teams or no. But did you have any teams that you were that you were mulling over that that didn't quite make it? Yeah, I had BB and N in there, mm-hmm. um, just kind of in the mix. You know, obviously we talked about Ed Bourget already. They're kind of always just around, um, and you know they'll they'll be in the mix again this year. Yeah. Um, but those were those were kind of the ones I was I was really focusing on, um, and then. BB and ended ended up not making the the official ten, mm-hmm. but they could have they could have been in there too. And then you had another story in the magazine uh, on Morgan McGathy from uh, Thayer and and how good she's been and uh, what what was that story like and 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 how did you feel about it? Yeah, I mean, so I talked to uh, Brandy Fisher Bailey at Thayer. Um, Ed, I talked to him since he's you know developing at Mass uh, yeah. development director at Mass Hawk. He talked to Morgan. He's done a pretty good job with her. Yeah, <laughs> done a Jeez. pretty good job. Um, yeah, she's just. Uh, just a name to know. Um, she's yeah. committed to Harvard. Um, very much just a rising star around here. Um, and you know, everyone when you when you get a prospect like this, whether it's boys, girls, everyone wants to talk about um, you know, oh, elite shot, elite <laughs> skater. But um, both Ed and Brandy both were just like she is the hardest working player that we've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Um, and even like um, Ed said when he first met Morgan, like she was like a, a, she was a di- she was a dynamic player, but she's really taking her skating to another level here. Mm -hmm. And um, he also said, you know, her shot, just because she's a goal scorer, she had, I think it was over a goal per game at Thayer last year, maybe 20, 27 and 26, something like that. That's not bad. Um, Yeah, (laughs) decent. Um, Almost a goal per game with the Wizards, too. It might have been like 28 and 29 games, along those lines. Um, And just, just raving about her release, you know, her improved skating, both of them raving about her work ethic. Um, just seems like they've got a real shining star here. Yeah, that's a prospect I think that everybody's going to be talking yeah. about again this year and I think is going to be a big focus of a lot of coverage. Uh, so that's the top 10. 
That's, I mean, that's a good solid list. You, you, I don't think anyone would know that, that it was your first <laughs> month here, but it was, no, it's, it's interesting. And I'm, I'm curious to see how it develops. Um, cause again, I feel like one, two, three, four are pretty set, but yep. I mean, I'm Gr- I like Groton as a sleeper though, that we're gonna have to clip that for Twitter. You know, <laughs> Groton is it the sleeper team this year. Um, do you want to make an elite eight championship, like matchup oh, prediction? Do I, do, do we, do we want to do this? Do you have one? If you don't have I, one, it's okay. I don't okay. have one, but um, just I'll, for entertainment purposes, I'll go Willison's back for a third straight year in the Elite Eight Championship yep. game. Mm-hmm. And Nobles is trying to give Tom Reeser one last ride. Ooh, I like um, that. I don't, I don't know who I want to pick out of the, out of that. I think just for the storybook, we'll go Nobles. Yeah. No, um, I like that. Don't yeah. pick the number one but, team. Yeah, for the storybook, we'll go Nobles. But again, any any of these teams I could see just making a run, especially like we said, that top four. I, I agree. Um, I will go one and two. I think Williston and Phillips, uh, it's a rematch. I think okay. it's, like, it's, it's like the Super Bowl this year. I yeah, think yeah. it's going to be like Eagles, Chiefs again. Mm-hmm. I think this is going to be Williston, Phillips, and over again. Okay. Um, I and, if I, and if I had to pick, if I had to pick, Williston is just so good. I, I got to go three Pete there. Yep. And I think that's going to be, uh, I think that's what's going to happen. Um, but again, would not be shocked to see Groton jump in that mix or what you said, Nobles. I mean, for we're in the business of, we want the best story. Yeah. Nobles would be the best story be with Reeser in the final season. Um, at least to, to that story basically write itself. Um, not saying that everyone else would be a bad story. Everybody else would be a great story. I don't want to hear from parents well, I mean, at ranks. Like, hey, oh, you think we wouldn't be a good story winning the thing? No, I think you would. But I'm just saying Nobles is just uh, elite with Reese or, uh, leaving. Yeah, I mean, think about Groton. Their their name is the, it's the Zebras. Who yeah. Who wants to see the Zebras win? <laughs> That's right. I would love, they need a zebra mascot on the ice. Yeah. You know, we got to really go all out for an Elite Eight championship. Um, but yeah, that's a great top 10. I, I think that was an awesome conversation. And we're going to transition over to overtime. David Yaz, our producer, always has the great questions. What's up, Yaz? Oh, not too much. Great to be back here for another session of overtime. And um, Pat, this will be your hazing ritual. <laughs> yeah, this is it. Lap <laughs> Welcome for uh, the Rinkwise podcast. <laughs> so far, you've been doing uh, all right. He's all he's all right. Evan. He's okay. We'll keep him around. But uh, in this edition of overtime, we will have three questions for each of our panelists. And today we're going to play a little rules trivia, hockey rules trivia. Oh, God. And so uh, (laughs) I won't be so cruel to Pat as to make him go first. Evan, you get the first question. All right. Hit me with it. Here it is. A a player leaving the penalty box notices that the puck is coming his way as he's exiting the penalty box. So he puts a stick on it. At the time, he's got one foot in the box and one foot out. Is this a legal play or not? I think he has to have both feet out of the out of the box, right? That's illegal. That's oh, there we go. Absolutely right. Yes, well done, Evan. I'm not great with rules. No, like, I, I remember that so much just from the youth hockey days. Kids coming out of the box. <laughs> oh, pucks! I'm just gonna stop it with my skate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right back in the box. Yeah. This one for you, Pat. Uh, a goalie loses his stick. A teammate picks it up as he will do to hand it back to the goalie, while. The player is holding both sticks. The puck comes by. He makes a play on it with his usual stick, then proceeds to hand the goalie back his stick after that. Legal play, yes or no? Oh, I'm going to go yes since it's with his usual stick. Uh, I say, I don't, I've question. never seen that. <laughs> I've, never, I, I've never seen it either. That, that. For the brief moment when the player is holding both sticks, he cannot attempt to play the puck or interfere with a member of the other team. The That's reason, interesting. It's, the reason is it's illegal to play with two sticks, which is why <laughs> nobody's tried that before. But that was a tricky one. I'll give you that. I like that. Evan, it's to you. A player standing next to his own net catches a puck that has been deflected into the air. He lowers the puck to the ice, but before he gets to the ice, he actually tosses it to a teammate. Legal play, yes or no? That is legal because it's your own zone. Absolutely right. Very good, Evan. Yes. Just the kid knows a thing or two about hockey. Well, that's the thing. When I was on defense and the puck again, I could just throw it to a teammate. Whereas if you're in the offensive zone yep. or the neutral zone, God forbid, you touch the puck. And it's or you know, it, the best is when two people, when when like your team's in the offensive zone, they drop the puck or they catch it and they throw it down. And then the other team just stands there waiting for the other team to touch it. So it's a whistle. I always <laughs> hated that. But yeah. So. Well, very good. Um, Evan has a commanding lead, but Pat, secretly, I'm still rooting for you. It's not <laughs> over yet. Okay. A team pulls the goalie, and the opposing team shoots on net, so we're looking at what's going to be an empty net goal. But there's a player in the penalty box from the opposing team. He's still got 10 seconds left before he's allowed to leave the box, but in desperation, he leaves early and blocks the shot. 
What is the call? <laughs> what is the call in this? Uh, oh, well, I've never. So, this is another thing I've never yeah, seen before. No. Um, well, I mean, you could say too many men, but I feel like they'll award the goal. Um, That's absolutely right. There you go. Yes, <laughs> under this under this rare circumstance, the referee can award a goal, so you can score a goal without the puck ever going into the net. Isn't that the same if you throw your stick? If you throw your stick, or if you know they have a breakaway on an empty net, you hook them from behind. Um, yeah, they just give um, the goal. That's as far as the research went on that question, so I don't know. But I'll, I'll I'm still missing that empty net, by the way. So that I'm still shanking it wide. I think that for the, the purpose stick. of this, they have. I think they have to conclude that the puck would have gone into the net. I think. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, okay. This one goes uh, back to Evan. There is one color of tape that is illegal for a goalie to put on the knob of his stick. What is it? Oh, I don't know. Um... Is it black? No. No, white's definitely final, fine. Final answer? Yeah, it's black. I'll say black. Black is oh. correct, actually. I think I've never seen a goalie stick with black tape. Yeah. The reason is, were the knob of the goalie stick to be covered in black tape, it could be confused for the puck during a scramble around the net. Ah. Uh, final question, Pat, and it is the most fun question on the board. Okay. Let's say uh, there's an instance where the referees don't show up for a game. They got caught in traffic or something. <laughs> They check for the alternate referees, also not available for the game. In this rare circumstance, who refs the game? Oh, my God. Um, when you just... Well, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. The home coach? Eh, no. Um, you, need, you, need, you would need to be even on both sides, okay. right? So who, yeah. who, who else might... Uh, who else in the building? It's. Not, I'll give you a hint. It's not a fan. Okay, oh. Evan, you want to guess? Um, no, I'm gonna let him continue. Okay. Not a fan, but so that could be a coach, a player, um, a timekeeper. Uh, I think you said player. That's correct. Okay. Well done. Yes. So I would have said, I was say I backup, said scorekeeper. I was gonna next say backup goalies. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a bad guess. Um, Yes. In fact, if the referees don't show up and the alternates aren't available, then each team can appoint one player, and those players officiate the game. Ooh. It actually happened one day in 1983. A snowstorm delayed the arrival of refs in a game between the Whalers and the Devils with only one official on hand and no qualified substitutes. New Jersey's Gary Howitt and Hartford's Mickey Volcan were told to don the stripes. That must have been weird. Wow, imagine, imagine that happened now? Yeah, or imagine like not calling a hooking penalty like when your teammates get hooked and you're like, don't see <laughs> like, it. Or, yeah, or not they gonna think do they it. get a penalty and you're like, no, dude. That, well, uh, wow. Well, technically, Evan won the game, but we're all winners here. Yeah, on, uh, the <laughs> Pat's podcast. a winner. We're winners because so. we have Pat. That's why we're winners. Um, yeah, that's interesting, though. I, you know, some of those, those were like, you know, remember those math questions you'd get on tests where it'd be oh, like, yeah. you know, like Jimmy goes to the store and gets 42 cans of paint and, and it just like goes on. on. Those yep. are some of the, like some of those rules. I was like, oh, penalty box. How does a penalty box have anything to do with the empty net? But it, it's a real rule. So good for you. Yeah. And it's, it's some of this stuff. I guarantee it absolutely never comes up, but that's what makes it fun. I like the, the idea that the I like the idea that you're in the penalty box and about to score an empty net goal, and you're just I can't let them do it. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta go, leave the box and jump in front of it. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, the only uh, parallel I can draw is, is the NFL. Every once in a blue moon, you'll see like in a college game the 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 coach will like trip a player. Yeah, yeah. Mike Tomlin. <laughs> Mike, Mike, Mike Tomlin. Tomlin did it. You're right. Mike Tomlin <laughs> Mike did Tomlin. it. Mike <laughs> Tomlin. Um, but anyways, uh, that was a great episode. Power, happy to have you. It was a, a great time. Uh, what can people look forward to from you uh, over the next couple months? Yeah, so I mean, kind of wrapping up this week, we got our end of uh, girls prep previews. And yep. then, then we're getting into the season. Um, you know, just getting ready to, excited to see some rinks, get out to some games. Um, Eat at bad pizza places around yep. the ranks. Try, try the rink fries <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, when I first started last year, I was like, oh, I'm going to try a pizza joint within like a mile of every rink. And I got a couple down and then it was like, I'd leave the game so hungry and have a bad slice of pizza. It's like a waste of money, waste of calories. So I stopped. But I, I think this year you and I should coordinate on something food related. I yes. think we need yes. to like, we need to set a rule like if we go to a place can have something from a rink so if you guys want to give us advice should it be pizza should it be fries what should it be um we will we will take that um i know that someone from framingham 
premium high assistant coach Eric Libby and one of the players I forget who it was tried something in every rank I forget what it was and they ranked it and put it on Twitter and I was like okay. that's a great idea yeah. so I, I gotta go dig that up um, but yeah it's gonna be a lot of content this this winter yes. a lot and a lot of podcasts as well um, so that's Pat Donnelly I'm Evan Marinovsky this is Rinkwise, a Siemens media production you Rinkwise listeners have a great rest of your week